bluebells are out, it is May and spring is here so it is time to wrap up the books that I read. Now in April I had some time off work and I did a little trip to Devon in the southwest of England. While I was there I did some walking, I did lots of art which you can see on my Instagram and while I was doing this I was listening to lots of audiobooks and I've noticed that about half of the audiobooks I read are on a similar theme which is lady scientists in fiction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mention them in this video but I'll do a separate video where I actually talk about them and wrap them up. Book number one falls into this category and this is The Lie Tree by Frances Harding. I've actually done a full video on this book because I loved it that much. Book number two was a non-fiction title and this was Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. I was familiar with the idea of the 10,000 hour rule before reading this but I wanted to read about it a bit more in depth. So this is the idea that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to become world class or you're properly good at something. What this book also does is it explores different ways that success is generated and different cultures and how they feed into the ideas of success. A very very interesting read and I, I would recommend it if you're interested in kind of the, the psychology and sociology and background of these kinds of things. Along similar lines book number three was Daily Rituals How Artists Work by Mason Curry. Now this is a book which looks at lots of different artists and writers throughout history and their daily rituals, what, what they did on a daily basis and how, how they worked. Now I found this really really interesting but the problem that I had with it was I was expecting a bit more analysis and a bit more statistical interpretation of these, these different patterns because there were definitely patterns but it was just presented as this is the information, do with it what you will. And while that does have its merits I was expecting more of this and so I was a bit disappointed because of that. Book number four was Treats by Lara Williams. This is a short story collection published by Freight Books and I really enjoyed a lot of the stories in this but I felt like it took me a bit longer to read than it should have and that's because I stopped reading it and didn't feel compelled to pick it up in the same way as some of the other books that I've read this month. I think it's just that thing with short story collections where some of them I really really loved and other ones just I didn't connect with. But I would recommend this collection and it, it deals with themes of growing up. The stories towards the start of the book are more based on people in their 20s and as it progresses the characters get a little bit older and we see different stages of life. It's a very clever collection and I would suggest that you try it. Book number five was a lady scientist book and this was the signature of all things by Elizabeth Gilbert. I was very pleasantly surprised by this and I'll talk about it more in my other wrap-up. Book number six, another lady scientist book, this was Remarkable Creatures by Tracy Chevalier, another really good read. Number seven was State of Wonder by Anne Patchett. I hadn't read any Anne Patchett before and I would definitely be reading more of her works because this was fantastic, another lady scientist one. Number eight was a lady scientist book by Barbara Kingsolver called Prodigal Summer, another enjoyable read. Not quite as good as the Anne Patchett but still very good. Book number nine was The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett which is a children's classic of course and I had never read the book and so I was, I was quite surprised by this, it wasn't quite what I was expecting. I knew kind of logically that it wasn't a magical realism kind of book or a fantasy book but I think the title kind of made me think that there was going to be something more fantastical happening and while there was that kind of feeling I was wanting a bit more I think of, of the, the strangeness of it. This book read quite a lot like Jane Eyre if Jane Eyre was a really unlikable character to start with and then had this kind of character development which you expect from the beginning. But I'm glad that I've read it now and it was enjoyable, it just wasn't quite what I was looking for. I read a few more classics in April and the next one, number 10, was The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. Another children's classic that I had never actually read the book of. I've read other bits of Kipling's work but never his probably most famous one. But seeing as the new film was coming out and I do want to go and see that, I thought it was probably about time to, to read this one as well. It's another one that might be quite good to design a book cover for as well, even though there are lots of them out there. I think it's, it's always a fun challenge to try and reinvent a classic. What surprised me about this book was the lack of, of an overarching plot. There was an overarching plot but it, it was more about these series of adventures that Mowgli has in the jungle which was really fun but it felt more like a short story collection in that sense. But I did really enjoy it and I have had the bare necessities stuck in my head since I finished it 
in fact, probably since I started it. Having read all of these lady scientist books, I was wanting more stuff that was set in a kind of jungle setting. So hence the secret garden and the jungle book. Lots of, lots of botanical things going on. So the next one that I read is also set in the jungle or in a rural setting. And this is another classic. It is by W. Somerset Maugham and it is The Painted Veil. I'd seen the film of this a couple of years ago and I was, I was surprised by the book because the first part of it is very, very similar to the film, but then they changed quite a few things towards the end of the film. So the book was, was a surprise to me. And I'm not sure which ending I prefer. I think I have problems with both endings. I don't know quite how I would rewrite it if I did rewrite it, but it was certainly very interesting to see those differences. And after finishing the book, I rewatched the film and just noticed those things all over again. The film has a wonderful soundtrack. There's, there's lots of sati, which I absolutely adore. So I would recommend the film. I'd also recommend the book. Probably read the book before the film. The plot of this book is about a woman called Kitty and she is married and is in this loveless marriage with her husband who is a bacteriologist. They are living in Hong Kong and she has an affair with another man who is also married. And when her husband finds out about this, he takes her to this remote part of rural China where there is a cholera epidemic. And of course he is a bacteriologist, so he feels that he can be of some help there, but it's also clearly a type of punishment for his wife. All of the characters in this are utterly horrible, and because of that, they're really interesting. And I'd love to know that if any of you have read the book and watched the film, what what did you think of the ending and, and how it differed in, in the two mediums? So book number 12 is another classic, and I read this straight after The Painted Veil because in my head, I kind of got the two of them confused, or at least they were very similar in my head, and they are not similar at all. The thing is, this is Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And of course, the reason that I thought that they were similar is that the Painted Veil is set in this cholera epidemic. Love in the Time of Cholera seems to have less to do with cholera than the Painted Veil. It really is an epic love story, and probably the most epic love story that I've read in a long while. There are lots of really whimsical elements, and I really enjoyed that about Marquez's writing. I did try to read 100 Years of Solitude a while back, and really couldn't get into it I think because there were just so many characters and I was not in the right headspace for that book at that time. So I enjoyed Love in the Time of Cholera, I wasn't crazy about it, I don't imagine that I will be rereading it and I've been finding that I feel like this with classics increasingly these days. I know it's a modern classic and generally I enjoy modern classics more than classic classics but I tend to read them more for the sake of having read them and so that I have a better framework for, for my knowledge of literature overall rather than for for the pure enjoyment of reading them, if that makes sense. This might be a topic for a whole other video, but I enjoyed book number 13 more, and this is The Ecliptic by Benjamin Wood. And I don't have the book because I read it as an audiobook, but I do have this little postcard that I picked up at the London Book Fair. And oh my goodness, this was really incredible. It is about this artist who goes to this artist colony on this island, and we're not quite sure why they're there and and their, their sort of motivations and there are some weird different characters going on. It's one of these books that has a lot going on and there are lots of revelations as you go along so I, I don't want to give too much away but if, if that sounds interesting to you at all. I love reading about artists so that really appealed to me and the whole remote island thing was rather appealing too. It has a fantastically gothic vibe to it and it is really beautifully written and really well paced as well. I think, yeah, the, the pacing in this was just so perfect and I, I can't recommend this enough. It, I'm, I'm still thinking about it now. It's, it's that kind of book. Book number 14 was another lady scientist book and this one was A Natural History of Dragons by Marie Brennan. So I will talk about that in my other video. Book number 15 was The Portrait by Ian Pierce, and I read Arcadia by Ian Pierce last month and I thought that that was just an incredible book and this this was another really good read but it was on a much smaller scale than um, than Arcadia. Arcadia is very epic, lots of different threads going on. This was much more simple. It is basically a, a monologue and it's this artist talking to the sitter of this portrait. So it's all from his perspective, all this, this monologue. And the artist is creating this suspense within the story and we know that there's going to be some sort of revelation 
to, to the sitter and it, it's all being teased out as he goes back and revisits the past. So there's a lot to do with class and art and love. The sitter is an art critic and he is of a higher class than the painter who is a Scottish man and the narration is done by Peter Capaldi aka the 12th Doctor. So I can highly recommend the audiobook on those grounds. It had a lot of similarities with the ecliptic actually because it's about an artist and it's set on a remote island. It also has that thriller kind of pacing to it, or at least it seemed to have that drive that, that thrillers have. That's another Ian Pierce novel to recommend. Book number 16 is a very different type of book and this one was by Sarah Waters and I have really enjoyed all of the Sarah Waters that I've read so far and this one was no exception. It was The Night Watch which is set during World War II and this is set in three parts. The first part is after the war, the second part is during the war and the first part is an earlier time in the war. So we see where things are after the war and as we read through the novel we see how things got to the way that they are in the first part. And Sarah Waters has done such a good job in pacing this novel so that these pivotal points are at come at just the right time. She creates these connections with the characters so that you want to keep reading and you want to find out more about their lives and you recognise as you go further through that not all the characters are as blameless as they seem at the beginning. And I had to stop myself after finishing this from just diving into the next Sarah Waters because I want to pace myself with her work and because I know that she is really good and I really trust her as an author I, I want to save them for points at which I feel in a, in a reading slump of some sort and just need a book to, to pick up the pace. So these books are perfect for that. I don't usually reach for novels that are set during either of the world wars, mostly because the perspectives that they are from are, are usually a soldier's perspective and that doesn't interest me nearly as much as the home front and any sort of marginalised perspectives on the war. And that's exactly what this is. It's the home front in Britain particularly in London, and it is the lives of LGBT characters during this time. And that's not something that is explored nearly enough in fiction, I don't think. I think we're up to 17 books now. And this next one was also by Barbara Kingsolver. I read one of her other books earlier in the month. And this was The Poisonwood Bible, which I have been meaning to read for years and years and years. My mum told me to read it years ago, <laughs> back when I was at high school and I just never ever got around to it. So finally, having read Prodigal Summer and really enjoyed it, I thought, okay, it's time to give this book a go. And I didn't actually enjoy it nearly as much as Prodigal Summer. In fact, I didn't really like it all that much. The, the more I think about it, the more troubled I am by it. It's set in the Belgian Congo and is about a family of missionaries who have gone out there and are trying to spread the word of God and not having all that much success at it, to be honest. It's about their religion experiences and how that develops over time and we know from fairly early on that some sort of tragedy occurs and they're reflecting on this but it really focuses on the family and their, their lives within this new setting and how they really don't cope very well with it at least certainly not to begin with so it was interesting but I wouldn't reread it and I wouldn't especially recommend it really. I think there are much better books out there. The final book of The Lady Scientist's Persuasion was Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. I'll talk about it more in my other wrap-up. And the final book and one that I really enjoyed was Under the Udala Trees. This is by Chinello Operanta and I was really impressed especially as it is a debut novel. Sometimes debuts can be a bit shaky but this was this was pretty solid. This was kind of like Chimamanda Nagoya Gozia Dice meets Jeanette Winterson. It's set in Nigeria and it is about this young woman and her struggles with her sexuality. It starts off during the Nigerian Civil War and our main character is sent off to live with this other family. She's essentially working as a house girl for this couple and while she's there she falls in love with another girl who is equally lost and disorientated in this new world order or lack thereof. And it's about what happens from then as her mother finds out and so that's where the parallels to Janet Winterson come in, her mother is very religious and is totally shocked by this abomination that her, her daughter has become. She essentially tries to perform some sort of exorcism on her daughter. So that really reminded me of Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. To date I've found it very difficult to find examples of LGBTQ literature that is from different backgrounds and backgrounds different to my own. Most of the stuff that I've read has been from a British perspective or American. So if you have any more examples of books from, from different places and different backgrounds that have LGBTQ themes, I'd be very interested to know. But yeah, this is this is another book that I, I really recommend and 
think that more people should read. So there we are, those are the books that I read in April. I will be uploading another video shortly talking about all the lady scientist books that I read in a bit more depth. Until then, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram and Pinterest. I am at Holly Dunn Design. And if you want to see examples of my book design, they are all on hollydunndesign.com. As always, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye. And the illustrations in this are done by Katie Scott, who is such a talented illustrator and I absolutely adore the stuff that she does.